Okay, me again. Hang on, I got to find my sermon. There we go. So this morning, um, we had these two very different passages. Um, and um, so I was thinking this morning that one sort of represents inheritance and the other movement. I should also warn you beforehand that after the sermon that we're going to be breaking out again into Zoom groups to give you some time and you can respond to either the passages or the sermon, um, which, whichever, whichever you choose. But there will be some, some time um, for all of us to reflect on these passages. So we want to start with the Genesis passage, which is the inheritance part of the, part of the sermon. Um, and it's all about birthright. And there's, there's so much interesting stuff in the story, but I wanted to start with some visuals. Um, so I've asked uh, Scott, I think, to throw up some visuals for us just to, to change our mental picture of the people in this story. Yes, um, who do you want first? Uh, Jacob first. <laughs> Um, you didn't give me Jacob. I did. Do you want me, you want me to go oh, find Isaac. Jacob? Isaac. Sorry. I have, I have Isaac and Esau. I no, should give, probably... give us Isaac and Esau. I, I didn't have Jacob. Okay, I've got them one at a time. So you want um, Isaac, Isaac, first. Isaac first? Okay. Okay. We've got Isaac. Okay, so there's Isaac. This is not a picture, right? This is, uh, right? But, I, you know, I've got these white people in my head. So I wanted, I wanted to give myself a different visual. So then, and then Esau. Let me find. That's not Esau. No, not quite. White guy. The hairy dude. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. There we go. So we got the redhead here, right? A little lighter than his brother. Um, definitely on the red side though. Thank you, appreciate that. Do you want me to look for Jacob still or? No, that's fine. Okay. It gives us, gives us a sense anyway of of what's going on. Now, again, back to my sermon. Okay, so, right, so there's lots of really interesting bits in this, in this story like this. There's the whole background theme of, of the firstborn and the importance of the firstborn. And the Old Testament talks a lot about how important the firstborn is. Um, on the other hand, it's very hard to think of an actual firstborn in the whole Bible that does well outside of, say, Jesus. Um, but otherwise, pretty much all of the great heroes of the Bible are, are, uh, are second or third or like uh, David was seventh or eighth in line for, for firstborn. Um, so, so there's this odd thing going on in the Bible of like liking firstborns and not liking firstborns at all. Um, Esau is one of the very few redheads in the Bible. And so there's not a lot of big, there's not a big redhead theme. Um, but here we have a, here we have a redhead in the Bible. The big theme, of course, is the outdoor macho dude versus the indoor mama's boy. Um, and, and right, so Esau represents the, the traditional masculine picture um, in, let's face it, most of Western society or Eastern society for that matter. And, and, uh, and, and, and Jacob is, is the other one, right? So we've got, we got these very two different, different uh, boys in the story. We also have a theme of hunting versus cooking, right? So that Esau is the man who goes out there and hunts in the field and, and, J, I, um, and Jacob stays home and, and cooks, right? And, and right in, in, our, in our congregation, we don't really have a lot of hunters. I know uh, Will um, hunts. Um, otherwise, I don't know a lot of you who spend much time hunting. Um, Dave might argue that mushrooms count but, uh, you know, you just don't see the mushrooms running away at the same sort of speed. Um, so I think, you know, we'll give mushrooms a pass on this one and say we just don't have a lot of hunters here. Um, and not only do we have hunting versus cooking, but we have vegetarian cooking with lentils too, right? And, and vegetarian cooking could potentially be a major threat because it, the men really aren't being necessary at all anymore. If you know, women can cook without meat, like what, what are the guys for? Um, Right. So this means that, that for the, you know, for the, for the guys here who are listening to this story, there's lots of emotional buttons being pushed. I'm guessing that as I was doing this, you know, lots of you guys had, had, you know, going to the way you were raised and the kind of person you were supposed to be or, or, or weren't supposed to be. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of emotion 
um, in, in a story like this without it being particularly emotional on the surface. And, and so one of the things that would be also interesting is to hear how, how women respond to this, this very masculine story. Um, right? The only um, woman in the story is Rebecca at the beginning of the story, um, who, is, who is barren at first. And of course, in the Old Testament, it's assumed that it's her fault and not, um, and not his fault. Um, but anyway, right? So, so we, do have, we, do have, we do have some of that. But in any, in any case, this is a story where in the traditional in the macho culture, Esau should have won, right? He's the hunter, he's the outdoor dude, um, and right, Jacob's just the, the, the indoor mama's boy. Um, and yet Jacob wins this, and it's sort of like an early version of Revenge of the Nerds is what this story is, um, which is an odd, odd story in the middle of an otherwise generally fairly macho Bible. But the last line is, of course, the, the key that I think we're supposed to take away, that Esau despised his birthright. And so the system here is that when the father dies, all of his stuff gets divided into, right, just divided among the sons. The daughters don't need inheritance because they've got husbands, right? So, um, so if you have like five boys, then your stuff gets divided into six piles and then the eldest gets two of them, right? Or if you have two boys, then everything is divided into three piles and the eldest gets two of them. So that's what Esau is giving away here, his right to the, the, the extra pile of his father's stuff. Um, and, and this, right? But it's just the, the whole sort of primacy of the, of the firstborn and Esau is just giving it away. Now, we're right. We don't really have a system like that anymore, but, but in our church, we do have inheritance. We do have birthright, um, which, we, which we all share, and which we exist in uh, you know, an interesting relationship to. Right? That, that part of the inheritance of being part of a church of the brethren is the church of the brethren inheritance. So that's, on, um, that's this one over here, right? And on this side is the Mennonite inheritance, which is sort of similar and different. And then there's our congregational inheritance of being Morgantown Church of the Brethren and the way things are done around here. Um, but not, not overwhelmingly. It's not like, well, that's the key. We have to keep doing things the same way every year. We don't have you know, a lot of traditions that are, that are rigid like that. Um, and so this is all part of the inheritance that comes from being part of a group, being part of almost any group. And, and we as a church certainly are, are you know, an organization that has lots and lots of heritage to it, um, right? We keep reading from this 2000 year old book. So there's lots of heritage. So that's the, that's the inheritance side of the picture. And the other side of the picture is Jesus' story in Matthew, which is more about movement, um, not so much the church going somewhere, but the church being, being an organization that's supposed to be doing something, right? So, so this sower goes out and he sows the word of the kingdom, that there's something's going to be happening, something should be happening. There's this movement going on. The early church was not an institution, right? Like with a building and all of this sort of stuff. It was a movement. It was supposed to be accomplishing something. And the work of the movement and the, the word about the movement was spread by folks talking about it, right? So you'd go out and you'd tell your neighbor and invite that person to join this movement of, of the kingdom of God. And so there's lots of parallels actually between the early church and Black Lives Matter or the Poor People's Campaign or Mountaineers for Progress or whatever sort of modern movement, you know, or Make America Great Again, right? These are all movements and they spread via people getting excited about the purpose of the movement um, and, and people talking about it and other people joining in. So Jesus talks about that in his parable. He talks about the various reactions when you go out and tell people about the movement. So in verse 19, he talks about the people who hear the word of the kingdom and do not understand. Right? So that's the first task. Right? As, as we go out and try to explain to people where it is we are going as Morgantown Church of the Brethren, as this movement we are part of, right? It needs an explanation because there are people who, who simply don't understand 
um, what's going on or, or what it is we're trying to accomplish. It's sort of like the, the modern defund the police movement and, and, and lots of people who hear that, they just really get scared and they don't understand what that could possibly mean. And so it needs some explanation. In a lot of ways, the church is a bit different in that um, people sort of assume they know what you mean when you talk about a church and they don't think movement at all. They think opposite of movement. They think stagnation. They think, well, yeah, this is an institution and it exists and it's solid and, you know, and it doesn't go anywhere. And so in a lot of ways, the first step toward education you know, in the church is, is re-education, is uneducation. That you have to say, no, no, we're not, right? we're not building an institution. We are, in fact, building a movement here and we're trying to accomplish certain things and, and here's what they are. Right? So education is the first roadblock we could, we could encounter as we're trying to build this, this movement, this, uh, this new world that we're trying to build together. The second thing Jesus talks about is the seed that is sown on rocky ground. And this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such person has no root. Right? So there's, there's this immediate springing up of joy, but there's no, there's no inheritance. Um, and that's where the inheritance part of the formula becomes important. And one of the advantages the church has over against so, so many other modern movements is this inheritance, that we've been at this for a long time. Right? And, and we, we have ways of doing things that we understand what it means to sustain a movement. Right? That, that like, like, Black, my, la, oh boy, like Black Lives Matter says regularly, Right? This is a long race. Right? This is not a sprint that we're in. This is a marathon. This is going to take a long time. So how do we sustain this long movement? And the church has good resources for that. We have these traditions. We have buildings. We have institutions. And those are all right, good things to sustain movements, um, recognizing that sometimes the, the trick is not to have the focus being on the institution itself, but on maintaining the movement. Right? But sometimes the institution is necessary for the maintaining of the movement. And so hopefully we, you know, as a church, can offer our, our roots um, to other groups who have sort of parallel kind of interests in mind. The third group that Jesus talks about starts in verse 22. As for what is sown among thorns, it is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lures of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. On the negative side here, you could say, well, yeah, you know, some people are just more self-interested and more selfish than they are interested in the larger world. And, you know, well, you can't help those people. But, but to be sort of more charitable, the reality is that, in some, that we, we are all that way, right? That if you're hungry and there's a climate crisis, well, first we're going to eat, right? Or if, you know, if you can't find clean water to drink anywhere, that's going to take priority over you know some movement that's going on here or there or or maybe not at all right you know you know if you can't find clean water to drink COVID isn't that important because you're going to die of thirst first and so we are all um, interested in the immediate over these long-term things and so it's very hard to sustain movements in difficult times that, that people are, are going to take care of the immediate first, right? That, you know, if, if the rent is due, then the rent is due. And, and so we as a, as a movement, as a church movement, right, do those sorts of things. Right? We have a sharing fund, and the purpose of the sharing fund is that so that people are immediately concerned with this. We can help you. We can help you take care of that. We can do this together, and then we're ready to move on in the movement. And so finally, Jesus talks about the, the, the final group of people who go out there and they, they get it, right? And they bear much fruit. And what's interesting is that Jesus never defines bearing fruit. Like, what does this mean? I, as, as I grew up, I always sort of assumed that bearing fruit meant getting more people into the church. Um, but, but that's not really fruit. That's just more branches. Um, <laughs> 
and, and, and what we're supposed to be doing is bearing fruit and fruit is actually succeeding in doing what it is the movement is supposed to be doing, I think, right? So whatever, right, however we define our goal in the short term or in the long term or in the context of Morgantown, right? Growth is not, growth is only useful insofar as it moves us toward the goal, right? It provides us success. So that's the, that's the, um, that's the sermon for today, that we have this inheritance. Um, but the inheritance also has a goal, that there's a movement part of this, and it's not survival, and it's not even just like getting more and more stuff. The whole goal of the movement at the beginning was blessing for the world. Abraham was supposed to start a movement, this long-term goal of creating a just and peaceful society that Jesus called the kingdom of God. And so, right, but our inheritance is that which provides this sort of steady base from which we can launch our movement. So that's my sermon for today. Um, and I invite you just to take a, a few minutes to, to think about it and to share with one another um, things that, um, right, that help you grow, things that, that, that have helped you over the past, um, or even just response to these very interesting scriptures that we read this morning. So Philip, if you can break us into groups, I'd appreciate it.